wonderful child. He's my savior. He's my deliverer. He's been my healer and my keeper. I don't know what you call him, but I call him Jesus. He's wonderful, counselor. He's my savior, and I give him glory today. Glory to his name.
for joining us for worship. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice, and we shall be glad in it. You're not with us by accident or coincident, but God has predestined that you be a part of this worship experience. He has a word for you, 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 yes, and even you. We are delighted. He has a word for all of us, and I am truly excited to have this opportunity. The word of God is coming to us on today as we celebrate our Christmas atmosphere of praise, Christmas atmosphere of worship and adoration. The title of the message is The Gift of Love. The Gift of Love. No one really expresses, I feel, the definition of love better than the, the author Paul who places his written definition, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 4 through 8. And there he records it, and of course I'm reading this from the New Revised Standard Version, but he makes the statement that love is patient. Love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. And it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And most interestingly is that love never ends. Love never ends. Our Christmas story is built on love. Love is its foundation, it's its walls, it's its ceiling. Love is the reason that we have Christmas. God has given us the most beautiful gift, and in it is our Savior Jesus Christ, and is wrapped with love on the outside and on the inside. If we can just imagine that gift being given to us this season, I would say that the story of Christmas is centered around Mary, her newborn son named Jesus, and her husband Joseph. No woman has been so honored as Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior, to the point that many peoples of various nationalities, various faiths throughout the world have named their daughter in honor of her. This Mary received the favor of God a humble young lady. I was surmised around the age of 15 to 17 years old. God saw her and chose her, selected her, and equipped her to be the most phenomenal mother ever. Mary is listed in the four Gospels and even in the Acts of the Apostles. According to the sacred record, Mary was from a small, unpopular village. So insignificant that it had been said, what good can come from this place named Nazareth? Mary and Joseph were of the tribe of Judah and the line of David. And I like to just make it clear that we might understand that this couple, Mary and Joseph, were in their first stage of marriage when God sent the angel Gabriel to her to let her know she was with child already. They were in the first stage of their marriage, which meant they were in the stage where the families had come together and they had agreed on the contract of the binding marriage between their son and Mary. It was called a betrothal, which is really just the first step of marriage in the biblical times. It was a business transaction between the families, more than a personal romantic kind of thing that we know today in our culture here in the United States. 
But they were married, actually. But it was only the first step. There were several other steps that had to come into play. And they were, first, the wedding ceremony. There had to be a wedding. And then, of course, the bride would move into the groom's house that he's provided for them. And lastly, the consummation of the marriage. So they're in step one. The agreement has been made between the families that these two are to be man and wife. The choices are made by the parents, not by the children in that time. And so when God shows up through the person Gabriel and gives the great news that she shall be with child, it was a most exciting yet bewildering encounter. At first, Joseph believed that his only recourse was to divorce Mary or to put her away. Well, that it gives us to know. You can only divorce if you're married. So for those who have taken it upon themselves to have mockery at the word of God or to jokingly say that Mary and, and, and Joseph weren't married and to disrespect the Holy Writ by saying, some awful things in that line. Let's make it clear. They were married. They were in their first stage of marriage. And that meant, in that stage, they couldn't see each other. There was no dating. It was a promise. It was a committed contract. And now it's time for her to plan the wedding ceremony. And this usually took a year or two. If she was 15... And the ceremony wasn't going to take place until maybe at 16 or 17. And the same thing applies today. When love comes into place in this culture, the United States, and the couple becomes engaged, and this is usually made upon their own choice. Parents don't make that decision today in our culture. But when a man and a woman come together and they discover, oh, we love each other and don't want to live without each other, then fine. They become engaged, and that gives them ample time to make it known publicly to family and friends. We have been spoken for. We belong to each other. They were just as good as married, really, if they love each other, and in their heart, their commitment is true. But some couples do, and they do take the liberty of living together before they marry. That's between them and God. We know what the Word says. And and some couples... Uh, they married privately, and they move in, and, and they set up home, and that type of thing, and they have a ceremony later when it's more conducive. But nevertheless, we, want, we wanted to know that this is, we're talking about the gift of love, and that God himself would never have put Mary in a precarious situation. He's a, a God of order, decency, and order. And so Mary and Joseph were married. They were in stage one of the marriage. And we're talking about the gift of love. The gift of love. It is just so one interesting that we find that Christmas gets to be a lot of hoop to hum, busying about food, gathering gifts. And we've done that over the years. And this year, 2020, December, we are faced with a new norm and a pandemic. And things are not quite as they have been in the years past. We face a challenge that we've never faced before. And that challenge is obeying the law of the land, the challenge is wearing face masks in public and keeping social distance of six feet. And downsizing our family social gatherings. And downsizing our, our, our faith concepts of worshiping. These are things we have been asked to do. And I really think it's a test from God, to be honest. He wants to see if we can do what he's asking us to do on a small level. 
so that others can see how much we care about each other. And we can say we're giving gifts of love, but are we really? Are we really giving gifts of love when we are disobeying the state guidelines, the CDC guidelines? When we've got experts and professionals in the medical field that God has ordained and has given them extreme and advanced knowledge in these areas, and they're giving you the best that they have for the, our best to receive, and we're still electing to have it our way. Ah, oh, perhaps we need to consider the gift of love this Christmas. Exactly what are we giving? And do we realize what it is that we have received? When we're looking at the message today of the gift of love, I like to say that we're going to examine the prophet's writing of Isaiah in the ninth chapter, verses 6 through 7. And in that chapter, and on those particular verses, Isaiah declares to us, For a child has been born for us, and a son given to us. And authority rests upon his shoulders, and his, he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continuously, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. And he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A oh, wonderful, what does that really mean? Wonderful is a miracle, it's miraculous, it's beyond compare. He's a counselor. This is saying that this gift of love from our Heavenly Father is Jesus Christ's son. He's our counselor. It says, for a child has been born to us and a son given to us. Isn't that awesome? And this declaration of God's promise of his son was 700 years before Jesus was born. It says that he's a mighty God. He's our mighty God. He's powerful. He's strong. He's the chief of champions. He's a conquering God. It says, for a child has been born to us and a son has been given to us. The gift of love, this thing we have, is everlasting father. The father of eternity. The planner of the ages. Of the endless times. The God of, of everlasting. Non-ending God. Oh, it says to us, for a child has been born for us and a son has been given to us. Not just to Mary and to Joseph, but to us. How generous is this God? This declaration is made 700 years before Jesus is born. And now it's over 2,000 years since his birth, since his life and his works, since his suffering and his death, since his resurrection and his ascension, since... And we are the benefactors if we embrace this gift of love that he's given to us. It's as alive now as it ever was. And even as we look there, we can't remember Isaiah reminding us, even in the seventh chapter of his writings. He said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. That just gives me to know that God elected to name his son. And he named him son Emmanuel. And he gave us to know that that defines the fact that he's with us. And then he clearly defined that Mary and Joseph were to name the son that he gives them, Jesus. He has a spiritual name and he has a, a physical name. He has a, a heavenly name and he has an earthly name. This Jesus the gift of God is 100% man and 100% God. And he's our savior for the asking, for the receiving, for the believing. All who believe in him shall have life everlasting and life eternal. I can't help but to look at the, the writings of Luke in the second chapter. 
And he is pinned there. He says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. May we keep that in mind? There was no place for them in the inn. It goes on. When the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. Isn't that beautiful? Just the thought that when our Lord and Savior arrives into this world, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, our Redeemer, He who bears our sins. The first to visit them were shepherds, the lowly ones. When they saw this, when the shepherds saw this holy child, they made known what they had been told about this child. They told as many as they could. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it was written. It has come to pass. The Bible says when the time came to completion, God sent his son. But the reality is, is that most people missed the miracle of the moment. Most people did not recognize the significance of the child's birth at the time. And many had given up hope and were no longer looking for the Messiah. Many had forgotten the prophecies of old. Others had lost complete interest. People were much too busy to pay any attention to the expected Mary, who stood there needing a room in the inn that she might give birth. And the only communication that's made is that we have no room. There are no vacancies. There's no space for you here. And so they reside. They find a quiet, dark edge of town and there is a, a manger. And in that dark, quiet part of town on the outskirts, Away from all of the excitement of the moment, there's a quiet spot. And in that quiet, dark spot of our world, a king is born. At just the right time in history, Jesus was born. The coming of Jesus into the world was not a matter of chance or accident, a coincidence. But rather, his coming was part of God's divine plan established before the foundation of the world, just for you and for me. Waiting for a deliverer at the time Jesus was born is where we, we would have been had we been there. We would have been waiting anxiously, hoping and praying that this would be the day we'd hear about this great Savior. The old philosophers lost this influence at that time and were powerless to change men's lives and there were strange new mystery religions that were introduced they were religiously bankrupt and spiritual hunger was everywhere they had lost their way toward god when when the gift was given to us and it was wrapped with love god selected the perfect time for his son's arrival because he makes no mistakes i am just so delighted that I can celebrate the gift of love and share that with mankind by simply telling the world that Jesus the Christ was born and those who saw him first were the lowest in the community, the shepherds. There were nameless, there were unsung heroes. And the others that were recorded as coming to visit him were the wise men. And that was two years later. It was a two years journey that they made from the East. We thank God for this gift, a gift that only he could have given us, a gift that we're so undeserving of. 700 years before the birth 
of Jesus, the prophets answered these questions. Who is the seed, the offspring of the woman who crushes the head of Satan? Who is the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that will eventually bless all the nations? Who is the prophet like Moses of whom God says you must listen to him? Who is the one crucified? Who is David's Lord? Who is the child that is God and will have an everlasting kingdom? Who was crushed and pierced for our transgressions upon whom died? Who? Who? Tell me. Who is the righteous branch, the wise king, who will be called the Lord our righteousness? Who is the one who is eternal, who will be the ruler over Israel, who was born in Bethlehem? Ephata. And who is the king of Jerusalem, righteous and having salvation? Who comes gentle and riding on a donkey? Who is Jehovah, the one that pierced for whom Jerusalem and all the nations of Israel will weep and mourn? Who is he? He has come. He has gone. And he will return again. His name is Jesus. It was Jesus then. It's Jesus now. And it will be Jesus when he returns. It's the greatest and ultimate gift of love. This Christmas, may we consider that we give a gift of love. Love is obedience. Love is forgiveness. Love is kind. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, he defined love. Share it at your tables this Christmas dinner. Elaborate on it. Let each one take one of those descriptions. And let them express themselves. Merry Christmas to all of you. I love you to life. May your gift be opened. And may you see that it is wrapped in love. Bless you.